Who are our greatest presidents? What lessons can the modern day business leader learn from our 46 chiefs of state? Find out in this podcast series with Tom Fox and Richard Loomis to delve into the great and not so great presidents to mine their successes and failures for today's business executive. Today's discussion is part of our series on presidents of the United States and the little known Gilded Age presidents. Today we're talking about Chester Allen Arthur, 21st president, who became president following the assassination of James Garfield. Despite being little remembered today, it turns out he's a pretty interesting guy and I think an underrated president. He was born in Vermont to an Irish Presbyterian immigrant father in 1829. His father later became a Baptist preacher who settled near Schenectady, New York. Chester had seven siblings who lived to adulthood. Echoes of the recent birther stories, he was later accused of having been born in Ireland or Canada. There's no evidence for either. Chester graduated from Union College in Schenectady in 1848, became a full-time teacher and also began studying law. He taught at the same school in North Pownall, Vermont, where James Garfield later taught penmanship. In 1853, he moved to New York City to read law with Erastus D. Culver, an abolitionist lawyer, and he was admitted to the bar in 1854. He participated in the Lemon v. New York case, which established that any slave arriving in New York with his master was automatically freed. He's also lead attorney in a case that led to the desegregation of New York City streetcars in 1854. He briefly considered relocating to Kansas, but returned to New York City where he met, married Ellen Herndon, whose father had recently perished in the sinking of the SS Central America. During the Civil War, he was commissioned brigadier general and assigned to the New York Militia's quartermaster department, where he proved so efficient he was elevated to quartermaster general. He was offered a colonel as, uh, uh, post as colonel in the 9th New York Voluntary Infantry Regiment, but turned it down at the request of the governor, Edwin D. Morgan. He was removed from his post as quartermaster general in January 1863 when a Democrat was elected governor, since it was still a political post. He returned to practicing law. When ex-governor Morgan at this point was elected to the Senate, um, he had close ties with Thurlow Weed, William Seward, and Roscoe Conkling. Conkling was elected to the Senate in 1867 and facilitated Chester's selection to the New York City Republican Executive Committee. Chester and the Conkling machine backed Grant in the 1868 election and raised large amounts of money for him. And Chester became counsel to the New York City Tax Commission at a salary of $10,000 a year, roughly $300,000 today. After some additional political maneuvering, Chester was named Collector of the Custom House at the Port of New York, which had nearly 1,000 patronage jobs under him. Although the salary was 6500 a year, he also received a cut or moiety of seized cargoes and fines, which gave him an income of more than $50,000 a year. His employees at the Custom House were required to pay campaign assessments to support Republican candidates. Although in 1872, as a result of pressure, Chester renamed them voluntary contributions. In response to allegations of corruption, Congress ended the moiety system in 1874, and Chester's income dropped to $12,000 a year. As part of his struggle to reform the civil service, President Rutherford B. Hayes fired Chester in 1878 after he had refused to resign a year earlier. He went back to working with Conkling and the Stalwarts to consolidate their control of New York State, and his wife died suddenly while he was away in Albany. He never remarried. At the 1880 Republican Convention, after the deadlock between Grant and James G. Blaine that we discussed in an earlier episode, uh, Garfield was nominated for president, and Chester Arthur was approached as a potential vice presidential nominee as a sop to the Conkling stalwart faction in an attempt to keep New York State. Conkling advised him to refuse it, thinking that the Republicans would lose, but Chester accepted it anyway. The election had an extremely high turnout of qualified voters, 80.5%, and Garfield won the nationwide popular vote by less than a tenth of a percent, although he won handily in the Electoral College. Tom, I think we should talk about machine politics in the Gilded Age and Chester Arthur's presidency. Where do you want to start? So uh, that's a great place to start, Richard, uh, because one of the clear themes uh, throughout this period is exactly what you said, the machine politics. And that lasted, I'm not sure it lasted to our lifetime, but certainly it lasted uh, perhaps up into the uh, 1950s. Um, I guess with Mayor Daley, we could say it lasted (laughs) well past. Considerably longer. Considerably longer. (laughs) And perhaps even still today uh, in the city of uh, Chicago. Nevertheless, 
uh, machine politics not only control patronage, control the jobs, but in many ways it controlled income. And you articulated uh, the moiety system quite well and the huge amounts of money it generated that were paid to author and others within the uh, custom house uh, brokerage or patronage system. One of the things that struck me about the author Arthur presidency was how he literally uh, grew into this office in a way that, uh, frankly, I was not aware of. And that uh, even in uh, the materials we read, I don't think we read anything about personal corruption, but being around that much money and being a part of that system, something uh, just didn't quite feel right about all of that and his role in it. And he did lead a very lavish lifestyle. And he did lead a, lead, lead a very lavish lifestyle, so perhaps it uh, was uh, in one ear and out the other, so to speak. Uh, but once he became president, he really took on the, uh, the machines, and he really broke no uh, quarter from them and was un, un, unswerving in his attempts to finish not only what Garfield had started, but what actually President Hayes had started in terms of civil service reform. So the uh, the machine, the Conklin machine in New York, I was fascinated to learn about the machinations of New York state politics and how in many ways it influenced the, the running of the country at, at this time. And that, that within this wing of the uh, Republican Party, uh, those pro-machine politicians were called stalwarts. So uh, interesting use of uh, name play. Um, didn't seem to me they were particularly stalwarty, but uh, perhaps they thought so. And uh, at least when it came to the traitorous Democratic Party. Uh, so, uh, well, one of the things that struck me, though, is you always hear about Tammany Hall yes. as being corrupt, which was the Democratic side. Yes. So when the Democrats were in power, they had control of all these patronage jobs. And when the uh, Republicans were in power, the Conkling machine had the, had the, had the uh, jobs. So it just didn't matter who was in power. Somebody was raking it off the top. Yes. So the um, we talked about the uh, uh, election of, of Garfield in a prior podcast, and the thing that really struck me was how estranged Arthur had become from President Garfield uh, at the time of uh, the, uh, not the election, but the inauguration. And part of it was uh, what the commentators I read, uh, I think, charitably called an ill-considered speech, yes. uh, where uh, he, he acknowledged that uh, perhaps in one state, uh, I think Illinois, uh, that there was, uh, I know you'll be shocked to hear this, corruption, and I'm shocked, shocked that there was corruption in Illinois. Nevertheless, uh, uh, it was a Republican state, so calling out your own party for corruption was apparently uh, an indelicate matter between president and vice president, and that uh, because Arthur really was from the other side of the party. There was no natural uh, constituency with Garfield and his team, and and he really was estranged from the president. Uh, he was not with the president uh, at the time he was shot. Uh, I don't think that was because of the estrangement. Uh, so the Senate was in recess. As president of the Senate, uh, he really had no work to do, so he was back in New York attending to, as you so delicately put it, um, uh, local <laughs> democratic politics, <laughs> uh, machine politics for the Republican Party when uh, he found out that uh, Garfield had been shot. Uh, and he did have, I think, suspicions were thrown on him because when Charles Guiteau did shoot him, he alleged is alleged to have proclaimed to outlookers, I'm a stalwart and Arthur will be president. Um, there was never any proof or any other um, evidence of a conspiracy, nevertheless, it did sort of taint his, I think, early days. And the other thing that struck me about this phase of his career, up, literally up to the time that uh, he takes the oath of office, was it was still unclear how uh, the transition was to occur. Uh, he, because he was in New York, he had the oath immediately administered to him in New York City uh, after after Garfield was dead, uh, but he had a state judge um, administer the oath. And there was some concern that a state judge could not administer the U.S. presidential oath. So they had to have the oath re-administered when he got to Washington. So uh, even... Also, the well, the position of uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate was vacant at the time. Right. And uh, and that was that would follow him in the uh, order of succession if he were to be assassinated. The whole issue of succession really had not been worked out. Nevertheless, there was an orderly transition and uh, no conspiracy party arose uh, to take um, take any any more nefarious actions. 
And this is where I really, um, I was very much surprised to, to see a man really seem like a, a machine politician uh, who had served the interest of his state as a state politician and, and really grow into a national leader because he, he took up the, um, the mantle of civil service reform. We talked about that in Rutherford Hayes. We talked that, about that a little bit with Garfield, and he really uh, drove it uh, home and uh, in a way that I think surprised many of the people who he had previously worked with. We're going to have a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Well, yes, and uh, the the civil service bill that uh, he ended up signing in 1883 was uh, sponsored by a Demo- or written by a Democrat. So he actually crossed the aisles uh, in order to get this done. Um, it, it, it was an interesting case. Now, he, now, now at first, it, it was of limited uh, coverage. It, right. it didn't apply to every federal job, but over over time, it grew. The um, couple of other things, and let me just pick up on your last point where he crossed the aisle. He had no natural constituency in the uh, Garfield uh, administration. And I think we saw this with John Tyler, that he really was an outsider in his own mm-hmm. administration. And once again, he was able to, uh, to he, or not able, he did use the veto, but he did use the bully pulpit. And he seemed to speak for what many Americans wanted, particularly around civil service reform. But he also took on uh, some additional roles in foreign affairs and uh, in immigration still was uh, a hugely controversial topic during this time uh, as well. And then we touched on this briefly um, in the prior uh, episode on Garfield, uh, naval reform. And the U.S. Navy had dropped from 700 vessels to just 52 uh, by this time. So now we're 15 years, 18 years after uh, the end of the Civil War. And uh, literally, there's four monitors left, uh, and they had to be completely rebuilt. We had uh, no uh, 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 steam-driven warships. Um, the Navy uh, only had three steel-protected cruisers. Um, so the Navy and any sort of home defense was completely lacking. Yeah. And as you mentioned before, this is at a time the government's running huge surpluses. Right. One of the other things that, uh, that Arthur did was he began to spend some of that money on internal improvements um, rather than just banking it, I guess. What did you think about his aligning himself with the Readjuster Party? That's a name I had never heard of. I, I, I will have to agree with you on that. The Readjuster Party was, I guess, what you would call a very progressive wing of the Democratic Party in the South. And they were able to elect one senator— uh, who held himself as an independent, but he largely voted with uh, the Democrats. Uh, but uh, he was this was a pro civil rights Southern senator, white Southern senator, Demo- no, former Democrat, former Democrat. Yeah. So uh, the Trader Party that yeah. we've talked about <laughs> earlier, and so I found that really interesting uh, that he did that. And the platform of the um, uh, readjusters was uh, the educational funding that we talked about earlier in an earlier podcast, but also the abolition of the poll tax and which I found somewhat disheartening, the whipping post. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, uh, these uh, parties seem to be uh, forebearers of what later became the Greenback Party or uh, other populist parties, particularly in the South. But they had some very progressive ideas, certainly around civil rights, but also around economic reform. On immigration, I think we'd have to say that Arthur's uh, record is considerably more mixed. He, he eventually signed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. He had managed to get the ban on Chinese immigrants reduced from 20 years to 10. But uh, after his after his term was over, it was subsequently re-extended and lasted until 1943, I think. So um, the other areas that uh, I found interesting were really around health. And, you know, we don't really have to take on the issue of health, at least uh, we don't know we have to take it on. Uh, Perhaps that's a better way to phrase it. But a leader like Steve Jobs, um, I've often wondered, should there have been more information in terms of an 8K type event? 
uh, if you have a CEO that is that dynamic and really is that uh, the brand is associated with him personally, and he goes into a long-term health issue, as Steve Jobs did, uh, when he uh, was treated for and died of cancer. Well, here, Arthur was diagnosed with something called Bright's disease, which was a kidney ailment, and he tried to uh, to keep it private, but uh, his physical appearance changed as he got iller, more ill. Um, he became much thinner, more aged in appearance, and he struggled to keep pace with the presidency. One of the things that was noted about the Arthur presidency was how slowly it moved. And the question I would have is, did it move that way in large part because he moved slowly because of these health issues? <clears throat> he took, uh, tried to take extensive travel uh, to help his condition, and I would have to say that was a bit of a mixed bag for him. But uh, he died uh, relatively shortly after his presidency ended. So I have to wonder how much that uh, uh, illness impacted him. We, we you know, we're going to get to Woodrow Wilson in there. We had a catastrophic medical uh, issue, which uh, in, basically ended his presidency some 18 months uh, before he left office. But, um, you know, John Kennedy had health issues that have now come to the fore and other presidents have had health issues. And so how much... Uh, uh, we're going to talk about Grover Cleveland and yep. a specific medical condition, if not a health issue. Um, so um, it really, this was, I think, the first president that we had some pretty significant evidence of a health issue impacting his role as a president. All, having said that, Franklin Pierce, uh, as we uh, talked about, um, may have been a living example of PTSD, yeah. uh, and if not uh, a closed head concussion. One of the other leadership issues that we have not talked about was the role of a woman called Julia Sand, who... Yes. Um, Shall we explore Miss Sand? I think so. She was apparently an invalid in New York City who took it upon herself to write letters to Arthur, uh, encouraging him to basically listen to the better angels of his nature. And there's a considerable body of thought that thinks she was largely responsible for his change in position on, uh, on the civil service. So when I read that, at first I thought, you know, is this Sister Mary Elephant yeah. uh, with her ruler uh, looking underneath her habit and saying, Thomas, it is just as evil not to do an act as it is to do an act. But you're right, there was an ongoing and robust correspondence. And although, as I recall, Arthur uh, either had or decreed that his personal papers would be burned at he his death. He had them all burned before his death. Before his death. He did not burn these letters, and they yeah. still exist, and we still know them. And she did. Uh, they had a robust correspondence that really around sort of ethical behavior. It's an area that uh, I think uh, we've rarely seen any president engage in. We've seen presidents have mentors or at least counselors, consigliaries perhaps. But here we had an invalided woman uh, that they only communicated via correspondence. I can't, I can't recall. I think they may have met once, um, but I don't even know if, if he was still in office at the time. So um, if there was one uh, kind of one thing that seemed to sum up the Arthur presidents for me, Richard, it was the following that I came across, that Arthur adopted a code for his own political behavior that was subject to three restraints. Uh, be, remain to be a man of your word be scrupulously free from corrupt graft, and maintain a personal dignity, affability, and geniality, uh, though whatever the circumstances might be. And that really seemed to sum up this presidency. And, and I have to agree with your opening remarks that um, I, I had to reassess this presidency. And he may not have accomplished a lot, but I think uh, he was able to strategically make uh, a difference in several important matters. And, and you're also right that some I thought he fell down on, certainly in immigration, on Native American and Indian rights. Uh, but in other areas, uh, he really moved the ball forward on civil service reform and kind of cleaning up the corrupt state politics. And proof that a person can change. Amen. <laughs> On that note, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fox. We hope you listen in for our next episode. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and rate the podcast. Thank you for listening.
So uh, back to the story of the annexation. Um, with the death of these two men um, and the impending uh, 1844 election, it was uh, becoming clear that uh, annexation would not happen. Uh, and indeed, when it was uh, brought up for a vote in the Senate uh, via treaty, it was defeated by a vote of 16 to 35. Part of those 35 were Whigs, and part of those 35s were Democrats who still did not support President Tyler. Um, subsequently, uh, Tyler recognized he was not going to be able to garner a nomination of either party, nor did he have the wherewithal to create his own party. And so he withdrew from the presidential race in favor of John Tyler, the Democratic candidate. And the Democrats, through their support, uh, to Tyler for annexing Texas. But here's the part that I found most interesting, the part Arthur Schlesinger, I think, uh, criticized, which was that he did not uh, try to have Texas brought into the U.S. via treaty, and I would say treaty because at that point Texas was an independent nation. So um, he did it via a uh, simple uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Schlesinger's criticism of usurp usurpation of presidential powers, um, but he was able to get uh, the resolution, joint resolution offering annexation of Texas passed in February 1845 by a 27 to 25 majority. Uh, now, um, uh, there was still some debate in Texas on the terms of the treaty, and it was not admitted to the Union until uh, presidency of James K. Polk uh, in uh, December uh, 1845. Nevertheless, um, in February of 1845, uh, the resolution was passed. And that really, I thought, was a, a, another very excellent leadership lesson. And really the two I had known about from Tyler before we researched uh, for this podcast, the annexation uh, strategy that he used, he had a very firm strategy in place. He had um, purged his cabinet and his uh, uh, staff of anti-annexation people. So he had a pro-annexation team. He had a pro-annexation message, and he was on message until the Princeton disaster. After the Princeton disaster, he was not going to be able to get it through a treaty, but he saw that uh, with the support of the Democrats, he could uh, pass it via resolution. And I thought that was an excellent example of uh, how you can change your strategy, uh, change your tactics, rather, so that you're, uh, at the end of the day, if you haven't won the battle, you won the war. There are a couple of other things that uh, happened during his administration. One was the uh, settlement of the boundary, northern boundary of Maine with, with yes. England, which uh, nearly caused a war. Um, and it... Part of that was uh, Tyler had a penchant for using the off-the-books budget that was uh, for basically espionage to appoint private uh, agents and not use the typical State Department apparatus in his negotiations uh, with England. But he also apparently slathered money around Maine to uh, unconstitutionally and illegally in order to uh, get support for the new proposed uh, budget. Or boundary, excuse me. Might one say he greased it? Yes. <laughs> there's a reason they're called grease payments. Yes. Well, Richard, there's a couple of other points that I'd like to just sort of end with uh, for today's podcast, which is one of the crucial lessons, I think, from Tyler is that presidents uh, should never be underestimated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly John Tyler uh, showed he was a very able a legislator and was able to get through, uh, as you pointed out uh, on the uh, treaty with Great Britain, um, uh, actually uh, Daniel Webster headed up that negotiation. Uh, so yet another uh, famous Whig. But uh, he should not have been underestimated. He was underestimated by his enemies. I don't think he had too many friends left. So um, the second thing is that in addition to the annex annexation of Texas, Really, I think we do owe a firm debt to John Tyler for uh, de demonstrating that a peaceful transition of power can occur even in the most dire circumstances, which were uh, the, the death of a president. Yeah, uh, I agree. And this one was really interesting because I knew virtually nothing about Tyler uh, again. So, This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Presidential leadership lessons for the business executive. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you would leave us a positive review on iTunes. It would greatly help.
us get the message out about one of the newest additions to the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you will join us again for our next episode. We look forward to visiting with you.